let me be clear. The lifting of the Title 42 public health order does not mean our border is open. In fact, it is the contrary. The Homeland Security Secretary making clear efforts being put in place to get the border under better control. The new rules put in place once Title 42 expires tomorrow. Tonight, the community is gathering to honor those eight victims killed in this tragedy as investigators continue to search for the shooter's motive. I'm Tim Pulliam with the latest. Live from KZ12, the news at noon starts right now. The end of Title 42, midnight tomorrow, but no one doubts the crowds gathering to enter the U.S. are ready to go now. Fears that border control can't handle the surge is so real. The head of it is explaining a new procedure that will now be followed. So the Secretary of Homeland Security detailing new consequences for those who cross illegally. Secretary Mayorka is saying there will be consequences for anyone crossing the border illegally under Title 8. Any migrant removed from the country will not be allowed to come back for five years. They can actually face criminal prosecution if they try to cross again. Mallorca says another rule being put into place involves something they call credible fear screenings. It means that people seeking asylum will have to prove they have a good reason to be afraid to go back to their home countries. The rule presumes that those who do not use lawful pathways to enter the United States are ineligible for asylum. It allows the United States, it allows us to remove individuals who do not establish a reasonable fear of persecution in the country of removal. In order to conduct the many credible fear screenings Mayorkas is now facing, he says at least a thousand asylum officers are headed to the border. The federal government also sending 1,400 DHS personnel and 1,500 DOD personnel, border officials, say they will need the extra staff. A Homeland Security official says U.S. border authorities encountered more than 10,000 migrants along the U.S. southern border just yesterday. That's already more than the government estimates for after Title 42 is lifted tomorrow. Meanwhile, one of the states where migrants have already been bust is preparing for the end of for, uh, Title 42 as well. New York's governor issuing an order to deal with that expected surge of asylum seekers. The order allows cities and states to tap into more resources for this influx. For instance, the order adds 500 more National Guard service members at Port Authority and various shelter sites to provide logistical and operational support. It also allows the state and municipalities to use funding they secured earlier this year to purchase necessary supplies and resources like food and equipment. All right, we're back here at home taking a live look out at the Alamo City. A lot of clouds in the air, a little humidity this morning, Justin, but only 74 degrees. What are we looking like? Well, these clouds eventually will break up. I do think we'll get some sun later this afternoon, so it'll be a somewhat warm day, warm and humid day, but the rain is pretty much out of here. We've got some showers off to the east of us as that low that brought us the rain yesterday moves north and east and away from us. So as far as any rain goes today, I'd say our chances are fairly low, probably 20% or less. And as we look at the pollen count, I wanted to mention this because it is uh, very important here. Molds jumped up into the very high category, 14,070, highest number we've seen in a long time. And with more rain in the forecast, you can bet these numbers are going to stay elevated. So just heads up there. Let's talk about some weather headlines for today. A quiet day. Thursday will be the same. So we get a little bit of a break in the action, but storms return Friday evening. We could see some severe weather Friday evening, and that's when the heavy rain threat also starts to arrive to the area of flooding. The likelihood of some flooding somewhere here in our viewing area is trending higher. And we've got to talk about that because it is going to be important this weekend, especially on Saturday. We are going to look into that forecast. Also look at the Mother's Day forecast and your seven day forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Thank you, Justin. New at noon, a man charged with intoxication manslaughter agreeing to a plea deal for a five year sentence. So police say back on November 20th of 2020, Robert Lee Colette Jr. was driving a pickup truck on the northbound lanes of Highway 281 near Thousand Oaks. That's when he crashed into the back of a white 1995 Honda Civic. The driver of that Honda, Sylvia Santoy, she died from multiple blunt force injuries. Colette waived his right to a trial, pleading guilty in this plea deal in exchange for that five-year sentence. If he had gone to trial and was found guilty, he could have faced up to 20 years behind bars. 
One driver has caused headaches for others in a neighborhood just west of downtown. But the problem is San Antonio police don't know who that destructive driver is. Katrina Weber reports that, that person ran away after a crash that damaged other people's houses. Through a small opening in a metal fence, an out-of-control pickup came close to doing big-time damage. It hit the corner of the home at the corner of Ruiz and Calavera Streets, taking out a chunk of the siding. San Antonio firefighters say the woman who lives here somehow slept through it all, only waking up when they knocked on her door after 7 this morning. I came out to see maybe somebody injured or something, maybe I could do something, help. Ruben Reyes heard about the trouble even though he was a few blocks down. He says the same truck had just caused problems practically outside his door. Before it hit the house down the street, it had slammed into another pickup parked there. No one was hurt at either site. He got hooked with the truck. She was trying to pull out, and when he did, he took off. When that truck was hit, it damaged a fence and garbage can. Neighbors say it had been parked there to get repairs at a nearby mechanic shop. You can see parts of the pickup here on the sidewalk. Well, this is where the entire truck was before it was shoved up clear on the sidewalk. Who will pay for all this damage so far isn't clear. San Antonio police are still searching for the driver who caused it all. Witnesses say after he hit the house, they saw that man take off running. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Katrina. Investigators also trying to figure out what sparked a fire at an abandoned home on the city south side. So this was the scene around 1145 last night. This home on March Avenue, not too far from Roosevelt and Stinson Park. Uh, we're told it's possible that squatters may have been in the house before the flames erupted, but still investigators working, trying to figure out what exactly sparked it. Luckily, though, no injuries were reported. One person dead following this crash on the city's northwest side last night. It happened at Grissom and Old Grissom near Calabar Road. That's where police say the driver of one vehicle crashed right into another. Details a bit limited right now, but officials say that the wet roads might have played a factor in this crash. Well, Texas House bill that would have raised the age to legally buy semi-automatic rifles, well, it lost its newfound momentum since it missed an important deadline. The delay likely ending this bill's chance of becoming a law. Now, the House committee unexpectedly advanced the legislation in an 8-5 to five vote that included two Republicans supporting it. But that left very little time for this bill to be added to the House's calendar. Tomorrow is the last day the House can actually pass bills and Uvalde families have been especially vocal about this piece of legislation. Now, the group Lives Robbed tweeting in response to the bill that missed this crucial deadline. It reads, quote, Phelan did nothing. Guillen sat on paperwork. Burroughs hid in his locked office surrounded by his NRA swag, saying, to continue, you're as spineless as the cops that stood outside our children's classrooms. Tweets go on to say they failed our children on May 24th, but the next one is on you. There's blood on your hands, end quote. Investigators in the deadly Texas mall shooting this weekend releasing some new details. They say that the gunman had three guns on him during the massacre. And ABC's Tim Pulliam reports law enforcement found more guns in his car and all of them had been purchased legally. Today, more pain, grief, and flowers at the Memorial for the Victims at Allen Premium Outlet Mall near Dallas. New crosses show the names of the eight victims shot and killed. Some people knew the youngest victim, three-year-old James Cho. Trinity Whitley was his daycare teacher. He was sweet and smart, and every day we're going to miss him. His parents also murdered in the attack. Investigators say Mauricio Garcia brought eight firearms with him when he unleashed chaos Saturday before being shot and killed by a lone police officer. Authorities say the three weapons on Garcia's body and the five found in his car were legally purchased. Detectives right now focusing on the shooter's motive reviewing the 33-year-old former security guard's social media profile, which investigators say includes racist, white supremacist views. We are trying to get into his computer and on social media and find out, you know, whether he had any anything that he'd publicized or been out. Images uploaded to an account last month suggest the gunman may have visited the outlet mall multiple times over the past year. To me, it looks like he targeted the location rather than a specific group of people. 
The Army says Garcia was removed from basic training in 2008 over mental health concerns, raising questions about his ability to legally purchase firearms. When you have people with mental illness, if, this, if it turns out that this gentleman has that, uh, when you have that situation, they will find a way. Several victims remain in the hospital as people gather here for this community vigil tonight at 7. There will be a prayer service at a nearby Catholic church. Tim Pulliam, ABC News, Allen, Texas. All right. Could there be new ownership when it comes to our San Antonio Spurs? Big moves made by Philadelphia-based Aramark in the last few hours, and we explain the latest moves and what it could mean next. The San Antonio Food Bank is working to meet the needs of our hungry community. We have a live interview with the Food Bank's Chief Development Officer in the next half hour. He's going to tell us how you can help them stamp out hunger. And San Antonio Public Library has a lot more than just books to offer our community. We'll look at some of the ways they're trying to help kids stay busy this summer. School might be out in just a few weeks, but the learning doesn't have to stop. The San Antonio Public Library gearing up to fill in that gap through different programs and some craft opportunities. That's right, Tiffany Huerta is exploring this summer's learning adventures at our local libraries. We have free play opportunities uh, that are open all the time for kids of all ages. It's a renovated space where children can play or read. We have uh, also books for all reading levels going all the way around the whole floor. The new children's area at the San Antonio Central Library opened just in time for the summer. Children learn through play. It's a key component of what we do here in all our programs with young children. This summer, there are different programs for kids of all ages. Each of our locations has weekly activities planned that will be facilitated by the children's librarians. And it's everything from art to building with things like Legos and other kinds of materials to doing different kinds of STEM and robotics. This summer, they will also bring different guests to the 29 library locations from magicians to writers. We have a couple live animal programs coming. We also have Opera San Antonio returning with their apprentice artists to do some wonderful music and storytelling with us. Unleash your creativity and let your imagination soar at the library this summer. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam before it starts raining again. <laughs> We've got, what, about 24 hours of just kind of hit or miss showers? I don't know. Justin said the rain's pretty much out of here. Isn't that what you said? Well, let's go with 48 hours. 48, 48 hours. hours. We okay. Days. We got a couple okay. days. But well, we, don't wash your car, though, if you want it to stay clean. That's true. Uh, we, we do have more rain in the forecast, especially this weekend. And that's a day, uh, Saturday especially, that we're watching very closely. The aquifer did respond from yesterday's rain. We're up 7 tenths of a foot to 639.8. And in your pollen count, we mentioned this earlier, molds are in the very high category, 14,070. Yes, more rain is on the way. We're going to time it out, talk about the severe possibility and also the flooding possibility coming up. All right. Has, has the rain inconvenienced you? Because you seem a little, a little upset with it. You're like, how much longer do we have? Or you no, just want a car wash? No, I'm very happy. I okay. don't have to water my lawn. That's fair. I'm putting in an herb garden. We're cool. Oh, you're good We're to cool. go. Where what are you good? going? <laughs> you can turn off your Herbs. sprinklers okay. this week. Basil, <laughs> oregano, thyme. Okay, okay. Y'all are going to like the results. cooking, right? Yeah. There you go. There you go. Self-sustained, I like it. Uh, yes, you can turn off your sprinklers this week. We're going to see uh, some good rain chances coming up. Not necessarily today and tomorrow, but over the weekend. Uh, we've still kind of been zeroing in on Saturday. The radar right now reveals that everything is moving north and east and away from us. That upper level low that brought the rain yesterday is pretty much gone at this point. And we're left with just some cloudy skies. As we go outside for you, it's still overcast. 75 at the airport, 76 and 75 at Kelly and 74 there at Randolph. Uh, pretty light winds today. We're not going to see gusty winds, uh, probably in the range of 5 to 10 miles per hour out of the east, and then eventually south and east. Uh, you look at the cloud cover, we are starting to see some breaks here, and I do think we'll get some sun over San Antonio. We're still forecasting skies to go partly cloudy a little bit later today, but again, at the moment, we're still pretty socked in. There are 
uh, less clouds around places like Carrizo Springs where temperatures have jumped up to 81. 85 in Catula, 80 in Pleasanton with a little bit of sun there, but underneath the clouds, we're still in the mid 70s from Gonzales over to San Antonio and still some 60s. Uh, places like Burning Stage and Bandera. Our forecast for today, we'll call it mostly cloudy through 2 o'clock and then partly cloudy 3 p.m., 82, 84, 4 p.m., and we'll get up to around 85 as long as these clouds do indeed clear out. And there is about a 20% chance for a pop up shower or storm. But I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, clouds build back in tonight and we'll start off cloudy again tomorrow. Uh, here's the big picture. Uh, so that upper level low, you can kind of see the twist there. That is moving north, so it's bringing rain up and down I-35 from roughly Waco up to about Dallas, and then you've got uh, some rain north of Houston. But we're on the back side of it now, and you can see things are trying to clear out here where we are. So the future cast takes that low north. We got another big area of low pressure that develops over parts of Colorado. Now this is going to bring some severe weather up there and even some snow, if you can imagine that, on the back side of it in the higher elevations of Colorado. This also plays a part in our forecast. It's going to push a boundary south into Texas. So that's one uh, component of our forecast. The next one will be a piece of energy developing to our south and west. This upper level low moves in as that boundary sinks south. We've got a ton of moisture coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. We've got Pacific moisture streaming overhead. So a lot of components coming together here to give us the threat for some heavy rain. And this is 7 a.m. Saturday. This model paints a pretty wet picture for not only us, but for a large portion of Texas. And then that continues right on into Saturday night. Here's my concern. Depending on where this low sets up, we could see thunderstorms kind of training over the same areas. If that happens, then we're going to get a lot of rain. And we know what happens here in Central and South Texas when we get a lot of rain. We have flash flooding concerns. So that's something we're going to be uh, paying close attention to on Saturday. On top of that, this is for Friday evening. We do have a risk for severe weather too. West of San Antonio, especially as mountain as the storms coming off the mountains of Mexico work their way into our area, there could be some hail and gusty winds. So that'll be a threat Friday night in tight say early Saturday morning. And then we run into that flash flood threat. Weather Prediction Center has us in a high risk for flooding as uh, we get into Saturday. Widespread four to six inches potentially, some pockets higher than that. Uh, so uh, again, as we've said, it's just uh, one of those days where you got to be so very, very careful. Uh, 87 Thursday, 86 Friday. We add in those rain chances Friday night, bring it up to 80% on Saturday, 76. 78 for Mother's Day, I think the flood threat comes down a little bit on Sunday, but we'll still have some showers and maybe a storm or two, and then even some chances going into early next week. Keep an eye on that one for sure. Thank you, Justin. All right, a familiar face in San Antonio leading the Lakers to the finals? Well, we're still a few steps away from that, but we're going to explain what Lonnie Walker did, why it was so special. And speaking of special, UTSA golfing. Look at this. Cameron Carrion crushing it on the course. Let's see how many alliterations I can throw in this script. We're going to explain what happened. <laughs> That's next. All right, ownership of the San Antonio Spurs continues to change. Aramark says they have reached a deal to sell half of the ownership stake in the team for $100 million. So all of this according to a report from Sportico. Aramark CEO John Zilmer reportedly in a call with Wall Street analysts yesterday saying they sold approximately half of their interest because there was a buyer who was working with the team to establish an ownership position and they have no intention of keeping the other part of their ownership. Remember, back in 2021, Sixth Street bought 20% of the Spurs and Michael Dell 10% at a reported $1.8 billion valuation. And speaking of the NBA, in the Eastern Conference semifinals, the Sixers winning big at the Celtics in Boston, 115-103, to taking a 3-2 series lead. To have my teammates be there with me through thick and thin, understanding, you know, what it is. And it's a great feeling, honestly. I'm really going to cherish this day and, um, and soak it all in. I mean, you know the name, you know the face. Look at that shot. Lonnie Walker scoring all 15 of his points in the fourth quarter two nights ago, helping the Lakers beat the Warriors 104-101. The Lakers now have a 3-1 series lead against the Warriors, the reigning champs in the Western Conference semifinals. 
All right, going to UIW, Shane Hireman introduced as the new head men's basketball coach. And during his presser, he said he wants players with grit and nastiness. Now, coach is 34 years old, and one of the first things he did was hire former Spurs guard Jaron Jackson as one of his assistant coaches. Hireman coached Jaron Jackson Jr. in high school, now of the Memphis Grizzlies, and Jackson Sr. was an assistant on that staff. They are reunited at Incarnate Word. There's uh, so many people that have come through the Spurs and it's impacting the world in, in basketball from a coaching perspective and it's doing great things and uh, and to just to be a part of that myself it's, it's a it's a blessing so and hopefully I can bring a little Spurs way here to Tim uh, Corny Word and to Coach Shane who who knows my my past and, and, and recognizes it and he he had a little taste of it with my son. I remember Jackson winning the NBA title with the Spurs back in 1999. And of course, if you remember the series, he scored 11 points in the title clinching fifth game against the Knicks. All right, TCU head coach Sonny Dykes driving from Fort Worth all the way to San Antonio this morning on an effort to speak at the San Antonio Quarterback Club. He said it's great to be here. He enjoyed the drive. Then eh, gave us a chance to ask him about UTSA head coach Jeff Trailer, who's having incredible success with the Roadrunners. Jeff's done a tremendous job at UTSA. I mean, I got to know Jeff um, and, and know him well. Uh, you know, he was a really successful high school coach, won a lot of games. You know, when he became assistant at the University of Texas, he's one of those guys that you watched and you just knew he was going to be successful. And, you know, I'm not surprised with the success they've had. Uh, I think the city of San Antonio has done a tremendous job of, of jumping in and, and uh, investing in the program, and I hope they continue to do that because if they do, they're, they're going to win a lot of football games around here. And, of course, we can celebrate head coach Trailer. It was his birthday this week, UTSA football, as you see on your screen. Tweeting happy birthday to the leader and uh, hoping you're having a good one, Coach. And speaking of UTSA, UTSA senior Cameron Carrion didn't let a rainy day in a 53-minute weather delay at TPC San Antonio Oaks course slow her down, entering the second round of the NCAA San Antonio Regional at one under par. Cameron fired a 5-under 67 to sit at 6-under for the day with a four-shot lead heading into the final round. Cam teeing off from number one, 855 in the morning. Oh, I can swing like that. I cannot. I, I can I, swing like that, but I don't make contact. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's always amazing to see these athletes on the course and then make it look so easy. Yeah. And then when you go out there, you're like, why, why can't I? <laughs> I can fully commit to the swing. It's just the connection. Yeah. That's a I'm working on it. Important part. In the summer, the San Antonio Food Bank makes a push for more donations. How rising food prices affect the need in our community and more answers about it in a live interview in our next half hour. And we're taking a live look at SA Live set, Historic Ooh, Market a lot Square. Of people. Got a group of fifth graders, GT fifth graders from Harlandale ISD with them today. Stay tuned. SA Live starts right after the news at noon. The San Antonio Food Bank has done a great job. It helps thousands of families from in and around our community, not just every month or every year, but every week. And in the summer months, the need seemingly only grows. That's right. There are so many ways to step up, help out, and to talk about that need and what you can do. Michael Guetta with the Food Bank joining us live. Good afternoon, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Max. Good afternoon. All right. So, Michael, give us some perspective. What does the current need look like for the Food Bank? You know, I know we've been a little quiet, um, but during this time of January, February, March, um, one big thing happened, and that was a rollback of some pandemic benefits that people got as a part of their food stamps. You know, but what we're hearing from families is it's really the challenge of working, but not having enough money or working and getting less hours. Those are the top two reasons we're seeing more people. And just to put a number around that need, um, February to March, we saw 38% more people asking for food. In sheer numbers, Max, that's uh, went from about 175,000 unique individuals in a week to 200 and, uh, 234,000. Okay, so that's a big jump, just February to March. And I, you know, as I said, there's some particular reasons around um, just you know, not making it to the end of the month and not getting enough hours that are driving some of that need. Michael, the, the summertime is also uh, kind of a, a tough time for families. Um, we know it's going to come every year, 
but we also know the food bank usually has to cover that gap of the food that families generally get at their school districts and what they have at home uh, in the refrigerator. Um, how can that, how can that, how can we help, I guess, in that particular time of the year? Well, you, you know, well, you described it. It's about 20 million meals um, that kids who are uh, in low-income families that they'll miss in the summer when they're missing that breakfast or lunch in a free reduced way at school during the school year. It's a big gap of 20 million meals. So we're going to rely on our community to join us in raising the food and the funds and, and volunteering, frankly, uh, to close that gap. Um, around the corner, you know, our letter carriers do something to honor mothers every Mother's Day weekend with a big stamp out hunger food drive coming up this Saturday. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of people might have gotten a, a blue bag of sorts in their mailbox that the letter carriers uh, put out. And thanks to CPS Energy for the help with that. But this stamp out hunger is just one way. It's immediate way now, but there are lots of ways between now and really the end of August that we need our community to help us with food, with funds and with volunteerism. Now, I, I don't want to be a damper, but this morning the consumer price index was released and per the CPI, food prices are up more than 7%. So you know, are you guys feeling that effect? I know you said you saw an increase to 240,000 or 234,000 unique individuals a week. But when that CPI number increases, food gets more expensive. How does that affect not only how much food you guys can give out, but how many people line up and how much food you guys can afford? Yeah, it's, a, it's an unfortunate bind right now. You know, need trending up, uh, especially as we get towards summer, but already trending up with the summer not even here yet. Uh, and food donations are trending down. Uh, we are seeing, especially the non-perishable food items, Max, you know, those staples like peanut butter and jelly that kids, you know, might want in the summer, mac and cheeses, rice and beans, the shelf staple items that really go a long way for families on a budget. Um, that's what we rarely see. That's what's so great about a food drive like this Stamp Out Hunger one this Saturday. It's our largest one day food drive in the year. Um, but again, you know, any church or business organization, um, I, we see kids taking up these food drives for the summer, starting them and, and then finishing them, you know, in June or July. Lots of ways that people can lean in to do it besides Stamp Out Hunger, but that's a great one too. Talking about the price of food um, affecting everyone, it, it makes you have more customers, um, but it also encourages people to donate, make a cash donation of some sort to the food bank. Because from what I understand, you guys have better buying power than I could offer at the grocery store, not to diss our grocery stores or anything, but you guys have some very deep discounts you can take advantage of. Well, it, it, thank you. And so often it is that um, the product, would, you know, the, the produce or the non-perishable items might be donated, and we're just having to pay for the logistics, for the transportation, storing, and distribution. And what that allows us to do is, um, like that grocery cart there, we can take $1 and provide 10 pounds of food. And generally we say that 10 pounds of food which equal $10, which provides 100 pounds of food, that 100 pounds is generally what you might put when you fill up a grocery cart. So our $10 goes a long way, and you can always make a secure donation at our website at safefoodbank.org. So if you don't want to do the food driver, or if you aren't going to be around to help with Stamp Out Hunger this Saturday, making that online donation is certainly one of the most efficient ways to do it. I also think, um, just as, as a mother, Filling up that bag inside the house in front of your kids and putting it out for the letter carriers is actually a really good idea um, to, to show kids this is what you do because it's yeah. very visual for them to take it out of the pantry, put it in the bag and stick it on the curb. I think it's the best, you know, teaching our kids uh, those little, um, you know, lessons and doing that together, um, seeing the letter carrier pick it up and thanking the kids um, as they're grabbing that and taking that away. I mean, there's joy, I know, on the letter carrier side when they see that. Um, but it's the way that we build our community up. Uh, we're not going to solve hunger by a canned good. It's really going to creating um, families and communities of conscience and people who have compassion. And this is it's a great way to do that. So thanks for calling it out. I think it's perfect. All right. Michael Guetta with the Food Bank. Thank you so much. Hopefully we can get someone out there this Saturday morning to talk to you guys about stamping out hunger. Thank you, Michael. Good luck. Thank you all. Thank you. Meantime, on Saturday as well, a good day to take a look at your pantry and gather up some things for the food bank because going outside may not be too much fun. It uh, potentially could be very wet here around the area. Uh, a good rainfall chance here over the weekend. And Saturday's a day we're particularly concerned about because there is a threat for some pretty heavy rain.
Let's look across the country and I'll, I'll show you that uh, Texas is still pretty warm, comparatively speaking. We're at 75 here in San Antonio, 80 out in El Paso, but not as hot as it is in Florida. 90 right now in Orlando at 90 in Miami, and you can bet it's steamy there too. The cool weather is up across the Pacific Northwest where we're in the mid 50s, Boise, Portland, Seattle. They are going to get some more weather, though, coming up in, the, in their forecast. And for us, a lot of the cooler weather you see here from Waco down to San Antonio is because uh, we have cloud cover. But once those clouds go away, we should see uh, temperatures warm up a little bit more. And those clouds are trying to scatter out. They're having a hard time so far, but mostly cloudy here around San Antonio right now. Again, 75, 80 in Pleasanton, 85 where there's more sun out in Del Rio, and 85 down there in Cotula where there's also more sun. Uh, just about everyone's in the 70s now with see, uh, and seeing a few peaks of sun. Our forecast today calls for just a 20% chance rain will make it up to 85 for high. 20% uh, chance this evening to temperatures in the low 80s and we dip down in the 70s tonight. Pretty much status quo the next couple days. But it all changes this weekend and we're going to talk more about how much rainfall we could see by Saturday into Sunday. That's coming up. All right, thank you, Justin. Republican Congressman George Santos now facing criminal charges. Santos now in custody after surrendering to federal authorities on Long Island. ABC's Rena Roy with a look at all the charges. Embattled Republican Congressman George Santos facing a judge today, just hours after federal prosecutors announced criminal charges. Santos charged with wire fraud, money laundering, theft of public funds, and making false statements. In the 13-count indictment, prosecutors allege he used political contributions to line his pockets, unlawfully applied for pandemic-era unemployment benefits, and lied to the House of Representatives. Santos expected to appear in court later today. Sources tell ABC News he's expected to plead not guilty. Congressman, did you misuse campaign finances? Santos hasn't said how he was able to donate more than half a million dollars to his campaign after earning just $55,000 two years earlier. He's also facing allegations that he illegally used campaign funds to pay for personal expenses like rent. Santos has denied any criminal wrongdoing. Are you worried about being prosecuted? I have, I have no clue. I don't know what it's about. You have no idea what it's about? Nope. There have been growing calls for Santos to step down. He's been accused of lying about everything from his resume to his family history. Will you step down? I will not. The congressman said he worked for Goldman Sachs and Citigroup, graduated from college, and that his grandparents survived the Holocaust and his mother was in the 9-11 attacks. All of that is untrue. Santos speaking with Piers Morgan on Talk TV. I've been a terrible liar. It wasn't about tricking the people. This was about getting accepted by the party here local. If Santos is convicted of a crime, he could continue to serve in Congress, though he'd likely face growing pressure to resign. He would have to be removed by two-thirds majority vote in the House. If convicted, Santos faces 20 years in prison, though it's unclear if he'll actually end up serving that much time. Rena Roy, ABC News, Central Islip, New York.